thank you so much for coming today. I'm thrilled and honored that you're here. And you've already met Catherine, our moderator. I'm Debbie Peterson. There are some experts in the room that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, one is Carl Knudsen, who we spoke with. And Carl is a certified fraud examiner. He's a private investigator. He's a retired internal service special agent. And I hope you don't mind, Carl, but I always have to brag about you because Carl is famous for masterminding the takedown of the largest known narcotics money laundering organization in U.S. history, and that was the Colombian Medellin cartel. But he also solved the CIA, Oliver North and Nor sorry, Noriega cocaine and arms yeah. scandal. So, Carl, thank you so much for coming here and also for everything that you've done for us in San Luis Obispo County. Um, and there's some others here, but I'll wait and see. I can't see everybody's who's here. So as I see you, I'll introduce. Here's a little, uh, just a few rules to make it a little bit easier to get through today. I'm going to continue to screen share and there'll be websites and details on the screen so that you can copy them down, take a photograph of them, um, watch for the tips scattered throughout the presentation. Please type questions and comments on the presentation into the chat and you can also type in technical questions if like me, you needed the moderator's help. And we'll have 20 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and comments. And um, I do really appreciate your insights. You're a very diverse group of professionals and there are no bad questions. So it's great to see your faces. If you're able to enable your video, that would be super. I'm a Californian. I moved to Scotland when I was 23. I started an award-winning business. I became the business personality of Scotland and then moved back to California. And I've been a real estate broker for 25 years here, over 500 win-win transactions with my team, and then served in local government for 15 years, including a couple of years as mayor. And that's how I know some of you. I've got friends here from many, many years ago, some through local governments, some realtors here, other just locals and other folks who were at the conference. When I was younger, I thought boards and boards of directors were extremely boring. So I'm gonna show you how I thought about boards of directors until I needed one and <laughs> developed one. So when I was younger, I thought of boards of directors as being actually more like the Mary Poppins model where uh, Mr. Banks uh, was fired, I think, by the board. And um, I thought they were really stuffy, hidebound, out of touch old white guys like the banker dad in Mary Poppins, or maybe more like the British Parliament where members spite one another while pretending to be respectable. The Honorable Lord so-and-so has only two brain cells to rub together if he thinks. Um, but actually they can be so much more. And since then I've come across many excellent boards, my association of realtors, for instance, the planning commission I served with for four years and chaired for two years and the homeowners association board on which I now serve. And we're not gonna go into all the details of, of um, all the characteristics of a good board member, but um, we're gonna go into a lot of things about what makes a good board here. Nearly everything you buy Every service you receive, every activity you participate in is run by a board. From the Cub Scout Parent Committee to Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson, to your service clubs, your church, to the people you elect to represent you and manage the millions your family pays in taxes over a lifetime. Your quality of life is influenced by the boards that serve you. Boards oversee whether you get good service, whether you get good value for money, whether you have safe and innovative products and practices or not. So it's worth taking time to consider how you can influence the caliber of the boards that serve you, or if you're sitting on a board, how you and your board can provide the highest and best to those you serve. I began to see how creative and constructive boards can be when I started my business in Scotland at the age of 24. I didn't know what I didn't know, but I knew there was a lot I didn't know. So when I saw an ad in the newspaper for a 13 week full-time start your own business course for entrepreneurs at Glasgow University, the Scottish Business School, I immediately applied. Until then I'd completed a degree in communication. I worked for a bank and two advertising companies as a marketing and public relations executive. And one thing that always embarrassed me as a young executive was that I didn't know how to read the financials and annual reports. 
but that was corrected by a crash course in small business financials on that entrepreneurship course I took. Back in 83, 1983, we didn't yet have Excel spreadsheets, so I had to sharpen a lot of pencils and use up a lot of erasers to manually create and add up a cash flow analysis, profit and loss, and balance sheet for my business plan. So here's tip number one for business people. For business people, board members, and citizens, learn how to read financials. The next thing I knew I needed for my new business was everything I didn't know yet about running a business. So I asked the experts at the Scottish Bishop School a question. I said, if you were a young foreign female starting a business, how would you compensate for all the things you don't know? Their response was immediate. They said, set up a board that can advise you, a board that has expertise in areas that you don't. And then they said, to do that, look at the best companies in the world and follow that model. Fortunately, there was a book about that. And although I don't remember the name of the book, I remember its teachings. I set about putting together a board that could advise me. I researched what makes a good board and I analyzed the makeup of the best boards and the best companies. And I've been following that model now for 42 years. What I learned applies across the board from corporate to nonprofit to government boards. But there's some important difference as well in taxation, ownership, and access to information. We're going to focus on the similarities because there are many more of those. The best boards are diverse boards. Boards where not just gender and genetic diversity are honored, but where diversity of opinion is invited. Sort of like democracy as it was intended, spirited discourse that leads to better outcomes. And we'll talk more about that later. The best boards are made up of all kinds of different people. It just sounds like a normal thing, of course, but it me, I mean it, all kinds of different people. It's people who see things through different lenses and aren't afraid to say so. The makeup of an entrepreneur's board should include, and roles might overlap, a like-minded entrepreneur, a professional, either an attorney, an accountant, or any other professional that's relevant to your particular business, a customer or two, depending on the different uh, the diversity of your customers, an academic in the area of business, entrepreneurship, or the specialty of the company, and a marketing expert. In my company, a baked goods manufacturer, it played out like this. My mother, whose business I modeled, was the like-minded entrepreneur and an auditor. My accountant sat on my board and my attorney sat on my board. I had two customers, a large supermarket chain cake buyer and a local health food store owner who was also a pharmacist and could advise on that part of the business. My academic, of course, was a lecturer in the MBA program from the Scottish Business School. I was the marketing expert, but I also had the head of a local advertising agency on my board. Board members must know their roles and responsibilities as directors. The members of my first board knew and behaved accordingly. They asked hard questions, they thought outside the box, they set the direction of the company, and they brought alternative points of view. As the company became more and more successful, I was asked to sit on other boards, and that's when I learned the number one most important thing that a good board member does. As my mentor, the chairman of an international bank, explained that the single most important thing a good director does is ask questions. He suggested that a good board member knows what questions to ask, particularly in relation to financial statements. He taught me to look for anomalies. More recently, I've come to explain it to citizens who are trying to understand local government budgets as just use the smell test. More professional jargon might be to look for red flags. Financials should be understandable. And if they're not, question until they are. Why does paying attention to the financials matter so much? Well, according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, fraud costs businesses in the United States 5% of their annual gross revenue on average. And that comes from the 2020 Global Study on Occupational Fraud and Abuse. It's the responsibility of the board to insist that it receives that adequate information and that it's understandable. 
good board members insist on performance evaluations of all executives, including the board. People in organizations can't learn without feedback. And no matter how good a board is, it's bound to get better if it's reviewed intelligently. One thing you might not know, and that is that your elected representatives sit on numerous local government boards. For instance, sewer districts, water districts, trash districts, and all other kinds of organizations and districts that you pay for with your taxes and that you give the authority to direct the way your taxes are spent. As a council member and mayor, I sat on 17 of these boards and many of the mayors of the government, or sorry, members and mayors of the government boards on which I sat had no clue as to the roles and responsibilities. Those with a clue were business people. Five of the boards were so lacking in checks and balances that if they weren't corrupt, they were wide open to it. And in fact, four of them were. And Carl Knudsen can tell you all about that because he was the auditor for some of them that got people put in jail. The other was turned around by three women CEOs who sat on the board along with a local newspaper publisher and co-opted his assistance to remedy the performance of that board. So what are the roles and responsibilities of the board? There are different types of boards, as we've talked about, government, nonprofit, and corporate, but the characteristic of the best boards and their members hold true whether there are any of those three. Good governance and accountability practices that include independent directors, regular audits, background checks, ethics guidelines apply to everyone, as does the role of the board. Directors, to be true to the fiduciary roles and responsibilities, must monitor the performance of the board, direct the CEO, and oversee the mission of the organization. The ideal board culture is the democratic government model, and that's designed to be a robust team of independent th thinkers who ferret out the truth, bring new ideas, encourage constituent voices, and consider the minority while legislating in the majority interest. It's a communication model that stands the test of time. People need to be heard, and the more they're heard, the better they're represented, and the more well accepted the decisions made will be. Most boards follow some, some, some form of Robert's Rules of Order, and that is tip number two. Get yourself a copy, the current copy of Robert's Rules of Order, and read it. <laughs> Agen and you know, it's not going to be boring if you're on a board because all of a sudden things are going to become clear to you. In Robert's, agendas are published in advance. They allow all parties to review agenda items and participate from a position of knowledge. The order in which the agenda items are presented allows first for a report at the meeting that should include analysis of alternatives to the recommended action, followed by an opportunity for the board to ask questions related to the report, then an opportunity for the audience, the public, the shareholders to be heard, followed finally by the board discussion and the vote. And in this manner and this order, everyone's heard and considered before the board deliberates before the decision is made. So what differentiates dysfunctional boards from healthy boards? The best boards are respectful of all participants. And this requires an understanding of the difference between dissent and disloyalty because dissenters may be some of the most conscientious and protective of the organization. Loyalty should accrue to the organization and its vision and mission, not to one niche of the organization and its cronies. So be aware of CEOs who don't welcome dissent and who try to pack the court. Healthy boards welcome spirited discourse. In short, what Yale's Jeffrey Sonnenfeld calls a culture of open dissent, a virtuous cycle of respect, trust, and candor. Watch for the common interview question, are you a team player? because that might be code to ask, are you compliant or do you make trouble? The highest performing companies have extremely contentious boards that regard consent as an obligation and that create, I'm sorry, that treat no subject as undiscussable. That's according to data compiled by Eisenhart and Bourgeois. So let me give you an example. When I sat on the board of a dysfunctional sewer district, I convinced the board to restructure the organization. We had a new superintendent, or at least an applicant. He was there at one of the meetings. And from the dais, I asked the question I asked regarding all leadership positions. In this, But in this case, the candidate was African-American. There was an almost audible cringe in the room when I asked, have you done a background check? 
But the beauty of that question in that situation, and something I didn't know at the time, is that the superintendent is a man of moral courage. He's an outstanding professional manager who also asked difficult questions, at one point actually telling the board that they could balance their budget if they got out of the legal business. They had half a million dollars of lawsuits on revenues of $3 million. He and I became great friends because of our mutual respect and commitment to integrity in the organization. And that's how it should work. Financier Ken Langone tells the story of a widely admired CEO who was invited to join the board of a famous corporation. Now, he was told as a matter of custom, new directors were expected to say nothing for the first 12 months. The candidate said, great, see you in a year. He explained, I ask a lot of questions and if I don't get the answers, I don't sit down. The sacredness of dissent and the freedom to voice dissent is laid out in the First Amendments of most democratic constitutions. The third thing that good boards do is that they change course based on deliberation. After soliciting shareholder and customer feedback, after disagreements are voiced, then boards sometimes reach new conclusions. Some of the best ideas come from customers, shareholders, stakeholders, residents, and voters because they're engaged and have an interest. So here's an example of that kind of win-win stakeholder participation. I'm on the board of a homeowners association of 324 homes. We have an outstanding architectural committee, but when it came time to repaint, they, um, they recommended colors of gray and Burgundy. The homes are in a tropical location, and the trend in colors the experts proposed, the burgundy and gray, were not popular with the homeowners. They insisted that we use muted tropical colors, and the homes are now painted, and they look amazing. So as I walk through my neighborhood, I am so glad we listened to our neighbors. In so many ways, the old adage, it takes a village, really is true. Leaders must hold the line AKA uphold the law to prevent mistakes and malfeasance. An organization's culture is determined by the approaches taken by the executive leadership. Leaders set the expectations for employee attitudes and behavior, and they provide for sufficient training and reinforcement of operational discipline. Boards are responsible to oversee and model and influence good attitudes and behavior. Poor leadership decisions have top-down consequences. They filter through organizational levels and damage the organization's culture. Ask NASA about an insidious pattern of behavior that's been noted in several high profile disasters. A compromised safety culture at NASA propagated itself into a disaster. On the eve of the Challenger launch, subcontracting sub engineers expressed concern, but they were told they'd need to provide evidence. The engineers didn't have the data because there were no tests. Risks associated with the shuttle's structural flaws, a cause for concern to external observers, had become imperceptible to many within the organization after many often innocuous mistakes reached the organization's defenses. Diane Vaughn, a sociologist investigating the Challenger incidents, dub dubbed it normalization of deviation, which starts with deviation from just one procedure workers become complacent. Deviant practices become acceptable. Recurrent deviant practices normalize even standardized practices and desensitize workers to risk because nothing happens, everything's okay. So the new tolerable becomes the lowered benchmark and more and more cyclical self-sustaining progression of devi deviations occur. It becomes a cycle of failure feedback loop. And without external audits, audits or procedure changes, the cycle of deviance is disrupted only by a bad outcome. Single deviations might not be explicitly harmful. Rather, it's the cumulative degradation of operating procedure that increases the likelihood of a major event. Individuals engaging in deviant actions often appear unaware of their deviation or they can feel it's justified, but deviance must never be overlooked. The presence of deviance inherently signals potential flaws within a systems environment or work process. There's another thing that I see often on, especially on government boards, where you have inexperienced board members, and that's the tail wagging the dog. 
board members and staff sometimes lose track of who's in charge. And they allow the CEO who, to run them rather than the board running the CEO. So we've covered mistakes. Now we come to malfeasance, white collar crime. Auditors and insurance agencies are becoming ever more sophisticated in their understanding of how to protect the public from corruption or otherwise called white collar crime, which encompasses lots of forms of fraud. Psychiatrists specializing in white collar crime counsel boards and executives that they have to be alert to the psychological culture of their organizations as their part of preventing fraud. White collar crimes are nonviolent, opportunistic, criminal activities committed by people of high respectability and social status in the course of their jobs. It arises in government, nonprofit, and corporate organizations alike, and the best practices to protect organizations also apply to all. By understanding the drivers of white collar crime, leaders can proactively mitigate and defend against malfeasance. Failure to understand these dynamics may indicate even a willful disregard of how crime occurs. In 2021, the United States prosecuted, or prosecuted 4,727 white collar crimes following almost 158,000 arrests. That's only 3% of those arrested were prosecuted. The FBI estimates that white collar crime costs the United States about $300 billion a year, 20 times that of burglary and robbery at 16 billion. Asset misappropriation is about 80% of the cases, 86%, and um, financial, financial reporting, misreporting, accounts for about 10% of the prosecutions. Insider trading carries an average maximum 20 year prison term and a maximum $5 million fine for individuals and 25 million for organizations. Pretty good deterrent for lots of us. 91% of money launderers go to prison for an average of five and a half years, which actually is much less than a lot of other criminals receive. The term white collar crime was coined to reflect the most common offenders, which are of course, people in the business sector. A demographic study from 2016 reveals that the most common offenders are married middle-class white men with steady jobs. Most of them live beyond their means. They're between the ages of 40 and 61, and they never had a previous charge. Male offenders make up 75% of the cases, while females commit less than 10% of white collar crimes. A 2020 survey found 37% of the crimes were carried out by internet perpetrators, and 20% were a collaboration between people inside and outside the corporation. And that's where 5% of our gross domestic product goes. The number one thing that psychoanalysts say will prevent fraud in your organization. Dr. Alexander Stein is a psychoanalyst and he's a corporate consultant and he teaches leaders the psychodynamics of fraud and of ethics, compliance and organizational culture. In his LinkedIn article, The Psychology of Integrity and Corruption, Dr. Stein says, the failure of leaders to understand the psychodynamics of their organizations, whether it's an active or passive failure, is a form of complicity with white collar crime. He says that leaders must assess the complex matrix of dynamic human factors, which unwittingly abet or facilitate corruption from a pragmatic pragmatic perspective, professionals who have oversight of the organization will be measurably better equipped to deter or resolve ethical lapses through deeper, more sophisticated awareness and understanding of the psychodynamic forces and the vulnerabilities in the organization. Now let's put that in more simple language. Stein says, white collar criminals are wily opportunists who recognize and exploit situational blind spots and vulnerabilities but they rarely act entirely alone. He maintains that the unintentional collaboration or collusion by both passive and active facilitators within the organization, irrespective of anyone's ethics and integrity, is a characteristic signature of all corporate malfeasance. 
Fraud studies show that fraud occurs either because of an individual's intentional betrayal of trust or a cabal that pushes ethical envelopes, or as Stein points out, and has happened at NASA, a culture of passivity. Stein says the truest determinant of authentic integrity is the ability to modulate and emotionally process lacerating disappointment, inequity, and other traumatic disturbances without succumbing to indignation or vengeance. He explains that successful executives modulate and exercise good judgment because they're able to, they're able to do three things. They can collect data, they collect data, they boil it down to its essence, and they act. Good judgment requires a director to perceive what's relevant, prioritize it, and finally use that information to inform his or her actions. Executives with high levels of integrity continue to have accurate perception even when the environment is ambiguous. Stein defines integrity as the capacity to exercise restraint, restraint irrespective of the capacity to act. He boils this down to what leaders have to watch out for. You watch out for an individual who's a person of influence, responsibility and reputational and economic power showing poor judgment, acting in malicious self-interest, however self-justified, with apparent disregard or indifference to the broader ramifications. In short, the red flags that boards mustn't miss are signs of poor judgment that manifest as self-interest without regard for consequences. And those who lack some or all of those three capabilities are potential white collar criminals. We have a sad example in my county of just such an actor. A county, super, a county supervisor time and time again emailed derogatory, even profane late night rants about anyone who disagreed with him often publishing the rants on social media or even in the press. He made it his business to destroy their careers and reputations. He was occasionally chided and he was always reelected. In the end, he committed suicide before he could be prosecuted for bribery, extortion, and sexual harassment, all of which he was, um, which he was alleged to be guilty of. So, don't hire and don't retain, don't vote for these kinds of individuals. So who are the people then who you vote for, who you put on your board? Who are the people who can exercise that restraint, hold the line and disagree respectfully? Former U.S. Attorney Robert F. Kennedy put it this way. He said, few people are willing to brave the disapproval of their peers, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or even great intelligence. Yet it's the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. So tip number three, when you enter the boardroom, check your ego at the door. Irshad Manji teaches with Oxford University's initial for initiative for global ethics and human rights. And she explains it this way. She says that neuro, neurobiologically, the ego is a function of the primitive part of our brain and it exists to keep us alive. It sounds the alarm to prepare us to fight or to flee. But the ego can't easily distinguish between mortal danger and mere discomfort. So disagreements may be misinterpreted by the ego as moral danger. It's a cognitive illusion because being disagreed with doesn't kill us. But ego can manipulate us into believing that we're under attack, that we've got to lash back or shut down. Encountering a point of view that persistently contradicts can raise defensiveness, anger, and ho hostility, and it can hijack our values of fairness. Instead of responding, the ego reacts. Instead of listening, the ego labels. Instead of communicating, the ego argues. Enter moral courage to speak truth to ego's power. Most of us must speak truth to our ego's power because otherwise we persist in scorning our critics when it's just as likely that we've chosen to communicate in a way that's a barrier to being understood. The person who's disagreeing with me is probably not a real adversary. In fact, they may be 
a friend. <laughs> when I manage ego, I find common ground with the other side. And only then do the possibilities emerge for co-created solutions that have buy-in. Exercising moral courage means listening to varied truths for the sake of progress. Listening to the other side doesn't mean agreeing with them. Rather, it means listening and countering the neg negative voice of my own ego. It clears room for me to consider points and ideas that I wouldn't have thought of on my own. It leaves the other side feeling heard. So when I lower the other's emotional defenses, I clear room for me to be heard too. But how do I learn to hear, not fear, different perspectives? Because the tribal impulse is biological. The us and them instinct is endemic to human nature but it doesn't have to be destructive. Us and them can cooperate with one another. By contrast, us against them is a win-lose strategy. Behavioral science shows that human beings universally fear being shamed, blamed, or labeled unworthy by the group, especially when it's the group whose respect we covet. And this explains why most people go along to get along but moral courage finds more creative options. It is entirely possible to both stand your ground and seek common ground. Seeking standing your ground is about what you believe. Seeking common ground determines how you express what you believe. And when you seek first to understand the other side, you override ego and you forge the relationship to hear and be heard. You win over the polarization that's fabricated by fear. The best leaders have moral courage and they foster diversity of opinion without division. Moral courage rejects the labeling and shaming of people. It defines diversity to include diversity of viewpoint. And it lowers emotional defenses so that we can think more clearly. It fosters both individuality and community. I'm passionate about boardsmanship because boards change the world for better or for worse. And as leaders, we can model leadership that engages, empowers, innovates, and creates that better world. So what is our job? Well, if we're directors, it's to serve well, and it's also to choose well those who serve. One suggestion, tip four, elect ethical business people because they can read accounts. They understand a bottom line. Elect more women to boards because for over 20 years, we've been hearing that women get better financial reporting, better performance, get things done faster. And if your motivation is to serve others rather than yourself, please run for local office and pay attention because your government belongs to you. Guard it well. If you'd like to see more from me, you can certainly look at the next screen. And I do have a special offer I have a course called Double Dias Adventures in Local Government, and you can get to it at debbiepeterson.com, which is my webpage, um, and all kinds of other things that might be of interest. And um, at this point, I think we still, oh, we've got 10 minutes. Let's take this 10 minutes and um, answer any questions in chat. And Catherine, I haven't been able to see chat while I'm talking. So I wonder if you could sort of go through there and see if there's some questions that we should be answering. And then we'll then we'll get to um, feel free to put your hand up, raise your hand. Um, sure, there weren't there weren't any questions in the yeah, chat. I just chat. I just wrote at one point, um, not uh, just a minute or two ago, that it, it, what you were talking about could basically uh, some of it be summed up as compromise when you're listening to the other person without the ego and hearing what they're suggesting and if you have your suggestion and there might be a middle ground there where you could compromise and and find a you know hopefully perfect solution <laughs> well there are probably no perfect solutions because there's always a chance that 49.99 percent of the people are going to disagree with you and you have to <laughs> you have to have the moral courage to live with that and um and i you what you're describing, yes, absolutely. Sometimes I don't like to use the word compromise because it, it, it can mean um, letting down your standards, um, but absolutely working together to find solutions that 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 most effectively suit people and understanding where the other side is coming from really helps to take the sting out of 
all of that. And, and it helps people to have buy-in if they participated in the process. Right. And I was just meaning um, like a, a middle ground. Yeah. Yeah, there is, yeah. 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 Because if you think about it, most of us occupy the middle ground. Most of us, if you're looking at a, a bell chart or a curve, most of us are somewhere in the middle and slightly, slightly, you know, left or right. And sure. so usually a middle ground decision is going to work for most people, more or less. And um, then I, I had one other thought and I'll get it out there and then I'll call on some people and see what they thought of, of the things if they don't speak up, up their their hands up Because people really, um, the people who are here today have a lot of insight and input. It would be great to hear from them. Right. And uh, the only other thing I was going to say is I imagine it's very important also for um, checks and balances in the boardroom, just like mm -hmm. there is or supposed to be in our democracy, it, you know, the government and that they, sh they should have the checks and balances. And I imagine that's yes. Yes. Yeah, that's why we re we should have an annual review too, as a board. And um and it's our job to ensure that there are checks and balances. And that's why you want really different types of people on the board who aren't afraid to, to uh, discuss things from their points of view or their point of professionalism. Right, right. Very interesting, Debbie, thank you. Um, anybody else gonna speak up? Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, <clears throat> Debbie, yes, I do Debbie. have a question. Thank you. I really, that was interesting about the ego and the moral. I, I, I tried to put everything that you said in perspective as to what I'm dealing with on a board of directors right currently. And I would like to know what your suggestion or anyone else's suggestion is when you have a, a board member who may, um, as, as I'm seeing going along, um, when, when they don't see their opinion being um, embraced, by other board members um, will just keep being repetitive and um, to the point of criticizing other board member, other board members' actions or opinions and how you would handle yeah. that. Well, I think it is something that 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 does happen on boards and it's not best practice, obviously. Um, whenever we're discussing, we shouldn't, we should be working as a team as a board in, in its best constructive sense. And so we should be discussing issues, we should be discussing procedures, we should be discussing best practices, how to do things. Um, but attacking one another absolutely doesn't come into it. So and that's I think one of the reasons when I was younger, I just hated watching the British Parliament, because they seem to constantly attack one another rather than talk about the issues. So um, absolutely. And that's where that respect comes in. It's respect for your audience, your shareholders, your customers, and one another. Um, and respect doesn't denigrate other people. Right, exactly. So how would you handle that during a board meeting? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, I think sometimes you have to just make that reminder. And actually, the chairperson is responsible for order. And so if someone's out of order, uh, the chair has has the obligation actually to bring it round to um, a more constructive way of speaking. Great, thank you. Any other questions, any other comments, feedback, suggestions? Everybody seemed to be listening yeah. really real hard well there was a, there was a lot there and some of it's really hard to absorb and um so i i don't know if we'll i guess i can i don't we've recorded this so we'll try to find ways to get the information out there so that you have this um to use in the future and there is so much more to being on a board that we didn't cover we couldn't cover today and i'm always available to consult um feel free to get in touch my contact information is up there and um, I'm just thrilled that you all came today and um, would love to work with you at any point to make sure that we have better boards wherever we're serving with those boards. You know, if it's something that you don't think about too often, if you're not, uh, you know, involved in it all the time. Yes, Dave. Well, I, I, I don't really have a question. Um, well, I mean, I got actually I have many, 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 many questions. But 
um, the the information on here is all. I mean, this is all great, great information. I'm actually kind of wondering where I can find this. Uh, you know, it looks like some of it was from a book, maybe, and or some sort of a pamphlet or something that that gives you shows you where you can research all this stuff. Um, uh, yeah, personally, I'm. I, Go ahead. Yeah, this is this is amazing. I'm I'm I really love it. And but one of the things that that some of the stuff that it, it's I know that compromise within a board is is really what what everybody strives to achieve. But I I just my uncle uh, I don't know if you remember Vern Dahl. Uh, mm. um, he. When I was running for Fort San Luis Harbor Commissioner, he was really helping me to understand, you know, how and what I'm supposed to do. And and during that period of the election, there was a lot of of media drama that and, and attacks and and things. I just was like, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I, towards the end, I, wait, I was going, okay, I, I don't know if I even want to really do this. This is, this, I mean, I was asked you know, by, by the uh, Chumash, actually, out of Santa Barbara, the Barbarino, to run. And I, when I was seeing what was happening in the media, I was, I, I withdrew. And I just, I didn't want to oh. be a part of, of this this these attacks that were happening and um one of the guys that was supporting me he says you know you, you're gonna lose if you don't try and inside i was going well i don't even want to try because this is the attacks that were happening were, yeah. were unbelievable i couldn't believe it and i uh i plan on running again I do plan Good. on running again for Good. the Harbor District, and because I know that there's been some the the there's been a a redistricting, and so that the territory that I get to run in is is a lot smaller and probably a lot easier than half the county. You know, and, uh, I'm afraid, Dave, I think we we might get cut off in about a minute, so I'm gonna um, just respond fine. really quickly. And that the course that Double Dias Adventures in Local Government is a perfect thing for you. Um, it's a four hour course that teaches you a lot of things that we couldn't talk about today in one hour. And then also, um, I have a book called um, uh, City Council One Hundred One. Um, insider's Guide for New Council Members. And in response to what you're saying, I'm, I know it's terrible and it's totally non-constructive. And when yeah. you get that kind of nastiness and um, because we should, it's the same thing as we were talking about on boards. It, it, it doesn't, you get nowhere when you polarize. And so um, one of the things that, one of the ways I, I managed it myself was um, I always remembered that none of that is about me. It's about the people who are doing it. So you just ignore it. It's not about you. It's about them. And as, and in everything that you're doing in public office or on a board, it's not, it really isn't about you. It's about the people you're serving. It's about all kinds of things. and not about you. And so that's kind of the same check your ego at the door and um, uh, let it go. And um, yeah. I, I really thank you for running, Dave. And I wish you luck in the next one. And I think we're out of time now, but I so appreciate, again, everyone coming and um, happy to guide you to more information and, and we'll get copies of all of this to folks. Yes, thank you everyone for showing up and thank you, Debbie, for the presentation. It was very enlightening. Um, just to let everyone know that uh, our next session is at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and it's with Leslie Grigg. And he'll be talking about the legacy formula, how to build businesses that survive and thrive across generations. He's uh, part of the tater tots. You're right at tater tots. So uh, <laughs> hopefully, you know, you might show up and, and listen to what Leslie has to say. Everybody's been great. And you were awesome, Debbie. Thank you so much. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie.